Zara Tyndall, a royal without a royal title. It's fair to say that Zara is a great credit to the royal family. She's added a certain amount of celebrity and a great deal of glamour. Fun-loving, colourful, upbeat. Zara is one royal unconstrained by old-fashioned protocols. A member of the royal family gets a tongue ring. She certainly did do things that, that sparked controversy. Tonight, we reveal what's really made Zara the progressive royal she's become and ask, how has her mother, Princess Anne, influenced her life? Zara has really looked to her mum as a way to live her own life. There is no pretense. There's nothing superficial about either of them. Did Anne manage to free her daughter from a life of royal restrictions? Anne would have just reminded Zara of her responsibilities, but at the same time, she allowed her to make her mistakes. And has Zara been given the life Anne always wanted to live? She has had a lot more freedom and a lot more opportunity than her mother ever did. Anne's vocation, her calling, her duty, was always to be the Princess Royal. What's their relationship really like? I think there's a lot of similarities in character. And how has it endured? They give you lots of advice. Yeah, and uh, criticism. <laughs> it is a unique and very close and, and very strong relationship. From sporting achievements... Anne was the very first member of the royal family to compete in the Olympics. Zara was the very first member of the royal family to get a medal in the Olympics. To their modern day love lives. I think Zara is, is very much like her mother in that she is a free spirit. She's had some quite colorful boyfriends in the past. The Princess Royal and her commoner daughter have far more in common than on first glance. This is the story of how these two women have defied and defined our royal family. The 15th of May, 1981. Princess Anne has a baby girl. Both are well. Zara's delivery was, was positive and quite urgent. I think she went into labour quite quickly with Zara. Good evening. Princess Anne tonight gave birth to a baby girl, a sister for Peter, who's now three. And she's the Queen's first granddaughter. It's not yet known what the new baby will be called, but whatever her name, she'll be sixth in line to the throne. From the very outset, the Queen's first granddaughter was marked out for an untraditional royal life. Firstly, in her name. Zara is quite untraditional. It's an unusual choice um, for a royal name. Zara lives up to her name, which means bright as the dawn. And I think it was a very imaginative suggestion that came from Anne's favourite brother, Prince Charles. I suppose the very naming of Zara with such an unusual and in many ways unroyal name perhaps set the precedence for a remarkably unroyal life, which is what Zara's enjoyed when you look at it. Anne decided very early on um, that, that her children would not be public figures in the way that she was. The key to understanding everything that follows comes back to this. The decision by Princess Anne that her children would not inherit royal titles. No HRH for Peter and Zara. It's called Dash. Dash. And you know it's the word you use when you're cross. Dash. It comes out practically well as a dog's name. Zara was the first royal granddaughter in 500 years to be born without a title. According to the 1917 letters patent, her children weren't eligible for a title because they're in the female line. So a monarch's daughter is a princess, but a monarch's granddaughter through the female line is not a princess. This could have been resolved if Zara's father had been given a title, but it seems Anne wasn't keen. When she was marrying Captain Mark Phillips, it was thought highly likely that the Queen would offer him an earldom. Looking ahead, have you been offered a peerage? No. Could you accept one if you were offered one? Well, that's a hypothetical question. I'm not... And I don't talk about it, so. It was Anne and, at the time, her husband, Captain Mark Phillips' decision not to take those titles. This was no small decision. 
Unlike her cousins, Beatrice and Eugenie, Zara would not be a princess. No curtsying, no honours, but crucially, much more freedom. The decisions meant that the children were going to be relieved of any kind of royal responsibility. Much more of Anne's life as a child was public than Zara's life as a child. Anne was very conscious that she wanted her kids to have a slightly more sheltered upbringing than she'd had. And if you speak to either Zara or Peter, they will also tell you that not having the burden of titles has enabled them to live ordinary lives. And although her background was privileged, living in a you know, lovely estate in the country, it, it's not as super privileged as, as living in, in palaces. Anne's next big decision gave Zara a life and freedom the Princess Royal could only have dreamt of for herself. While Anne's early schooling took place privately at Buckingham Palace, she was determined to ensure that Zara's early education was much more down to earth. It was a, a decision jointly made by Anne and Mark that they would send their children, first of all, to the local village primary school at Minchin Hampton. Anne's choice of secondary school for Zara was also a surprise. Zara would be sent to Gordonston, a tough, demanding boarding school in Scotland, famed for its cross-country runs and cold showers, not a school associated with young princesses. The Gordonston choice is quite an interesting one, but I think that's probably because Princess Anne detected in both her children that they were very outgoing and sort of outward-bound sporting characters. A far cry from Anne's own experience. At 13, she was sent to Benenden, a genteel and very posh boarding school for girls. These two decisions, no title and Gordonston, set Zara on her path, sporty, resilient and happy. Had Anne paved the way for her daughter to fulfil her first dream? Zara's uh, potential as a world-class sportswoman was developed. They really allowed her to flourish. When her daughter Zara was just 13 years old, Princess Anne sent her to Gordonston School, despite Anne's brother, Prince Charles, describing it as hell on earth. Gordonston is not for everybody. Prince Charles, of course, is famous for saying that he loathed his time in this Scottish boarding school. I don't think it's a school where a very sensitive and creative person should go. But, you know, the best will in the world, Peter and Zara, are not creative in that particular way. They're much more sporting types, and so they, I think, did prosper and in, rather enjoyed it up there. Zara and Peter actually had very positive, very happy experiences there. Princess Anne couldn't attend Gordonston. The school only began offering places to girls in 1972. But Anne was adamant that Zara would go to the school she may have longed to join, knowing it played to all Zara's strengths. They concentrated very much on the open-air life. There was a lot of sporting activity. Zara's potential as a world-class sportswoman was not only recognised, but developed. They really allowed her to flourish. She loved boarding, she did well at her A-levels. Post-school, Princess Anne was thrust into life as a working royal, but she had other ideas for her own children. She could see Zara's potential, and she wanted to push her to reach her goals that she couldn't because of royal protocol. Zara has certainly had more latitude than her mother. She's able to be just a little bit more relaxed. She's always had to make her own way in life and uh, probably had a much easier time than those that are closer to the throne and are, are given titles and, and do have to operate as members of the royal family. Anne's early decision not to secure a royal title for her daughter meant Zara had choices that she never had. Like mother, like daughter, Zara was showing signs of excelling on the junior equestrian circuit. Not having that HRH title, not being a full-time working member of the firm, means that she's had a lot more freedom and a lot more opportunity than her mother ever did. Among all the qualities that Zara and Anne have in common, uppermost is their enduring love of horses. It's impossible to overestimate the importance that horses have been 
in, in the princess's life. The British royal family have to be the horsiest family in the country. Uh, it's almost like they're pre-programmed to come out loving horses as part of their genetic makeup. Zara, as with every child born into the royal family, would probably have sat on a horse for the first time before she can remember now. In that family, you know, you learn to walk and then you learn to ride. You start on a Shetland pony and then you move on to a slightly bigger pony that's probably quite badly behaved and stomps on your toes occasionally. Pony Club puts a huge emphasis on horsemanship. So it's not just can you ride well, it's can you look after your pony? Can you do the dirty jobs? They'll be on the road every week, you know, through the season. And it's, it's quite simply a lot easier to get up and drive your horses to the events, ride them, finish and come home. For both Anne and Zara, these routines became second nature as horses developed into a professional passion and cemented their relationship with each other. I think for Anne and Zara, horses represent their freedom. Influenced by her mother's career, Zara would follow in Anne's footsteps. Eventing comprises of three disciplines, the dressage, the cross country and the show jumping. It's easy to forget because equestrianism doesn't seem so big now. You don't see it on the telly all that much. But Anne was one of the leading and most famous sportswomen of her era. Even if she hadn't been a member of the royal family, it would have been an incredibly impressive trajectory. She became the European champion in 1971 and she was only 21 years old, which is still an age that's eligible for young rider classes. So in the grand scheme of things, incredibly young in this sport. And two very familiar faces were on hand to present the princess with her gold medal. In the clip of that moment, Prince Philip in particular is absolutely beaming. Clearly so incredibly proud. Those are occasions when the Queen is present, of course, but she's, I'm sure she would think she's present as a mother. And it was a very special moment that the Queen was able to give the prize to her daughter. And it wasn't a special favour prize, her daughter had earned that prize. But Princess Anne's European triumph was followed by a frustrating run of bad luck. Her horse suffered a tendon injury, ruling her out of the Munich Olympics, and there was more frustration the following year. In 1973, when she was the defending uh, European champion, she fell off at the second fence at the Kiev European Championships. Go, go, go. Go, go. Then you have the press, of course, speculating, well, was she just a flash in the pan when she became European champion? That pressure was brought to bear at the next European Championships in 1975. After doing a very good dressage test, um, the media speculated that Captain Mark Phillips had doped her horse before the test because they'd seen him give the horse a sugar lump. When the horse was drug tested, it was all clear, but she'd had to go through the whole competition knowing that everyone was watching her and thinking, are you cheating? Cinder received her gold medal. She finished in second place at the European Championships and took home the silver medal. She looks at that as being more of a significant accomplishment because at that point she'd had just about everything that can go wrong, go wrong, and she'd learned to deal with it. In 1976, Anne became the first member of the royal family to represent Britain in Olympic Games. Riding goodwill in the Montreal Olympics of 1976, and she said, it's a unique example in equestrian history where the Queen had bred not only the horse, but also the rider. With a European champion mother and an Olympic champion father, it was no surprise when Zara began to forge a fine equestrian career of her own. Zara, unlike her mother, had no conflicting royal responsibilities, so she was able to throw herself completely into her riding career, and Anne was on hand to support her daughter, underlining their unique relationship. It was my decision to, if I wanted to ride, and they would push me, so, um, but when I did, they very much backed me up, and. You know, they're both very knowledgeable, unfortunately. <laughs> so they give you lots of advice? Yeah, and uh, criticism. <laughs> Zara may not have been pushed into equestrianism, but it was obvious that if she inherited her mother's ability without the constraints of royalty, she could potentially go much further in the sport. It was in the late 90s in her teens when she finished second in the Pony Club Championships that the equestrian media and then the regular media really started to sit up and take notice. Zara won silver at the European Young Rider Championships in Austria in 2002, 
and made her senior breakthrough at the Burley Horse Trials the following year, where Pippa Funnel won the illustrious event in Grand Slam. She'd already won badminton in Kentucky and everyone was watching to see if she could get the third one and the biggest prize of all. And Zara was very nearly the rider to stop her from doing this. A mistake in the show jumping cost her dear, but for 22-year-old Zara, making runner-up at Burley was a big step forward. To finish second in such a high-profile year, that was really the moment where people realised that she was a serious contender. Unfortunately for Zara, an injury to her horse ruled her out of the 2004 Olympic team. 32 years after her mother had suffered the same fate. Getting it right for the Olympics, you being fit and your horse, is, is very often, you know, a, a game that can go wrong. It's not just me who's had that problem before, you know, I think um, everyone on the team has had a problem in the past. There are a lot of things that can go wrong with horses and a lot of very minor injuries that can put a horse out of contention for major competitions. But Zara quickly put her Olympic disappointment behind her. After that, she started racking up the titles. In 2005, she went to the European Championships and became European champion. Yeah, she was a, a phenomenal, talented young rider and her horse was very impressive. Uh, and together they just made this, uh, you know, amazing pair. Zara had the chance to go one better the following year at the World Championships in Germany. But she arrived in Aachen in a state of shock. Just before Zara went to Aachen for the World Championships, one of her best friends, Sherelle Duke, had what should have been a very innocuous fall at a one-day event. She fell and then the horse rotated over and landed on top of her, causing grievous injuries that she unfortunately didn't survive. That was one of her best friends, a girl that she'd gone on holidays with in the off-season. They were very close. She actually wasn't able to attend Sherelle's funeral. Uh, her brother attended in her stead because the funeral was held while she was already in Germany. Remarkably, Zara kept her focus and went into the final event in the lead. Zara went into the arena with a German audience screaming so loudly that she lost her bearings for a moment, didn't realise that the clock had started and so lost seconds off her, her time show jumping round. But as she crossed the finish line and looked at the clock, she realised that she'd scraped it, she'd managed the win, she was the world champion. Cameras covering the competition managed to capture the raw emotion that was on display in this moving footage. A world away from the eventing arena in a star-studded, glitzy TV broadcast, we learned just how much Zara had touched public hearts. And the BBC Sports Personality of the Year for 2006 is... Zara Phillips. <laughs> to rapturous applause from the studio audience, Zara followed in her mother's footsteps to become the second royal family member to win BBC Sports Personality of the Year. People just voted, you know, again and again and again and in their droves because, you know, it, it, was, it was really important that she won because it, it caused global interest in equestrianism. And a lot of the phone-in votes seemed to be coming from Buckingham Palace. On your phone book. 35 years earlier, the award ceremony looked like a smaller, more intimate affair, but the achievements of both women were plain to see. Yeah, I think it probably made them realise that I wasn't just kind of playing around at it and <laughs> it was serious and it is hard work and, you know, hopefully they have seen that. But Olympic success continued to elude Zara after her horse Toy Town was again injured before the 2008 Games in Beijing. Her Olympic debut would have to wait until London 2012, the Games which Princess Anne had been so instrumental in securing for the capital. The London Olympics, which obviously was a, an enormous occasion for her to be a part of. It's all getting much closer and everyone's getting more excited. And Zara wasn't there just for the ride. In Jubilee year, the Queen's granddaughter, Zara Phillips, and her teammates were handed their silver medals by her mother, Princess Anne. Made it feel very, yeah, everything's worth it and, you know, we did a good job and we got an Olympic medal. You know, not many people could say that. 
Yeah, obviously it's amazing. It was amazing to get a medal anyway, so to get it from your mum was pretty cool. <laughs> Anne and Zara's relationship during this time just grew stronger, and Anne's early decision to allow Zara more freedom outside the royal family had paid off. Zara had achieved something Anne never managed. Well, they all rode brilliantly, they won the uh, Olympic silver team medal, things went well for us as well, winning the team gold. Zara and I had a great time afterwards and you know, I was obviously happy for her. We took a boat up the Thames um, with, with lots of the team members and friends and family and we just had a fantastic night, you know, going up the Thames, sat on a boat. Um, drinking, laughing, and, and just remembering, you know, how great the last couple of weeks had been. Zara's career has already long outlasted Anne's, and despite approaching 40, with no competing royal responsibilities to cut it short, it could go on and on. Turning 40 is very young in the, the equestrian industry. There are many riders who don't even begin to be known on the international circuit until they're the age that Zara is now. Her father, of course, was awarded the Silver Olympic medal on his 40th birthday by Princess Anne. Some riders are winning medals much later on in, in their careers, like in their 40s. And, uh, you know, as we've seen with Nick Skelton at Rio, even, you know, like coming towards 60. With Zara expecting her third child this year, the postponed Olympics due to take place this summer are off the radar. But future success is still very much on the cards. Just because Zara's now in her 40th year uh, certainly doesn't mean that perhaps she'll be slowing down even for the next 10 years. Her top horse at the moment is Class Affair, who has just turned 12 years old. So 12 years old is very much a little bit like 40 for riders, the time at which we start to see them step into their peak. It's still quite young. The 2024 Olympics, which will be in Paris, would be probably on, on Zara's agenda and wouldn't be out of the question. I'm sure her time will come again. She's, she's just way too talented um, and, and too young, really, uh, to think that she won't be back at the top. Next, from horses to husbands. While Anne and Zara bonded over life on the equestrian circuit, they had very different approaches to their love lives. One was duty-bound to have one of the biggest weddings of the 70s. And probably thought the whole um, wedding was a necessary evil. The other was free to marry in a way that suited her. I think that was a prime example of the freedom that comes with being a non-titled member of the royal family. Young and single, Zara entered adulthood, able to reap the benefits of freedom and the trust given to her by her mother. It was a stark contrast to Anne, who at her age was tied down by both royal duties and around-the-clock police protection. I think Zara had a lot of fun in her youth. Certainly she loved to party. Zara's brother Peter said she always liked being at the centre of anything fun and boisterous. Yes, her parents really encouraged her to lead a full and happy and successful civilian life, but unfortunately things didn't always go so smoothly. I think Zara is, is very much like her mother in that she is she is a free spirit, um, and she is you know she's had some quite colourful boyfriends in the past. I suppose her biggest romance was with a fellow jockey Richard Johnson, and this was quite a tempestuous, quite a fiery relationship. Just like her mother, Zara liked her men to love horses. In 1998, she fell for a 21-year-old National Hunt star. Not long later. Zara moved in with Richard Johnson, something that would have been unthinkable for her princess mother to have done with a boyfriend. Zara had a reputation for being a bit of a royal rebel, doing things differently, not really caring what anyone thought about what she did. Zara was one of the first younger members of the royal family to be able to live with a significant other without being married. Despite the freedom that Zara enjoyed, she couldn't completely escape the press speculation about the state of her relationship. You'd often see pictures of them out together, um, kissing. Pictures that I suppose further fueled that reputation for Zara as being a bit of a, a bit of a wild royal. 
Because they were both sort of celebrities in their own right in terms of the sporting world, they attracted an awful lot of attention. He went to a public school, came from a family with a great deal of land, but you know, they, you know, a very volatile character. And they also attracted attention because they tended to have very public spats, which is something as a member of the royal family you would avoid at all costs. And in January 2001, a row spilled over into the street. Royal rebel Zara Phillips is in trouble again after brawling with her boyfriend in public. Police were called to break up the fight between the Queen's granddaughter and her boyfriend, seen here on the right, jockey Richard Johnson. Neighbours heard a huge ruckus and it turned out that Richard and Zara were having a huge blow. Richard was said to have pulled Zara from the car and knocked her to the floor. It was later said to be an overreaction. That's of course how things are always described and, and Zara and Richard stayed together. But um, of course that meant that Zara was tabloid fodder for quite some time. One of the big problems the royal family is had this has got much worse in recent years is the way that the press treat them because certainly if you go back to the beginning of the reign everybody was very much more deferential and much more cautious but that's all changed of course Anne may have tried to protect Zara from the scrutiny of being a full-time royal but she could never protect her totally from scandal now I'm sure she was read the riot act by her mother following that because it ended up on the front pages of the newspapers. In turn, that reflects on the institution of monarchy. So Zara most definitely would have been reminded of who she is and who she represents by extension of being the, the Queen's granddaughter. But I think it, it really sort of shows Zara's tenacious side. But that Christmas, she and Richard were back in the spotlight again this time for a controversial cuddle worth £125,000. Princess Anne's daughter, Zara Phillips, has been accused of being the latest royal to cash in on her status. Zara had a reputation in the press for being a bit of a rule breaker, and she certainly did do things that sparked controversy. One of those things was agreeing to do a deal with Hello Magazine with Richard. This was the couple inviting the cameras into their Cotswold home. A cosy 13-page posed photo spread showed them lying together in each other's arms in front of the fire. And although the focus was supposed to be on the couple, all eyes were on Princess Anne's daughter. Public criticism, tabloid headlines, these were exactly the kind of things Anne had tried to protect her daughter from. Had her attempt to give Zara a more normal life backfired. It all felt very celebrity and not particularly royal. Anne would have just reminded Zara of her responsibilities, but at the same time, she allowed her to make her mistakes. It might just prickle Princess Anne that here were her children then invading their own privacy by inviting the cameras into their home. Anne must have known from bitter experience that with freedom came responsibility but perhaps she also recognised in Zara something of her younger self. When Anne was younger, she had that reputation for being a bit of a wild child. It was a bit of the attitude that Zara has as well, a bit of can do and don't care. Anne clearly understood just how intrusive the press could be when dealing with the private lives of the royal family. Her love life generated a lot of interest and I suppose further fueled that image of her being a bit of a wild child, which often got Princess Anne into hot water, I mean her attitude to the press. And in her younger days, Anne became known for her celebrated clashes with pushy journalists. In the early days of Anne's emerging onto the public scene, of course, uh, there was a great battle with the press. Actually, she seemed to enjoy the battle. I have to say, she, she gave equally as good as she got. Well. Your Royal Highness. Oh, you have a vivid imagination. And she also understood just how difficult relationships could be for royals in the spotlight. Has it been a great strain keeping it secret and indeed keeping it away from people like ourselves? <laughs> I think it has, yes, it became rather a strain. Yeah. It's funny with Anne, you, you wouldn't really look at her and consider her a romantic, but I think Anne probably is something of a romantic. She met her first husband in 1968, they met through the eventing equestrian circles and they got married in 1973. Do you think you would have married out of a sense of duty? No way. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you said that. <laughs>
One very brave reporter asked her at the time if she thought her marriage would be able to survive the pressures of royal life, and she snapped back, well, it's got to, hasn't it? Unfortunately, it didn't. The marriage was clouded by scandal. Zara was barely 18 months old as journalists dogged Anne on a charity visit for Save the Children in Africa. At that time, there were all kinds of rumours circulating about her love life, what was happening with her marriage, was her marriage breaking down? There were so many rumours of infidelity. She was visiting a number of different countries. And the press tagged along because they just wanted the gossip. They wanted the juice and they wanted to find out more about what was happening in Anne's private life. After public revelations of Anne's infidelity and a love child fathered by Mark, they separated in 1989 and later divorced. Anne's first marriage had become an open nightmare. She would never make that mistake again, and she wouldn't let Zara go through it either. So perhaps it's no surprise that Zara soon changed her mind about living her love life in public. After five years of media publicity and her infamous hello spread, in 2003 her on and off relationship with Richard Johnson finally came to an end. Enter England rugby player Mike Tyndall, a grammar schoolboy from Wakefield, Yorkshire. Zara met Mike Tyndall when she was in Australia in the November of 2003 when England beat Australia in the World Cup. She met this hard-drinking, professional rugby-playing guy and the chemistry between them was immediate. So he did exchange their private telephone numbers and when they got back, he telephoned and asked her would she go out with him. Amazing to do that with a member of the royal family when you think about it, even one without a title. Mike and Zara's relationship unfolded very naturally and they had a beautiful foundation as friends first and I think that has what served them so well. By April 2004, Mike and Zara were an item and Zara introduced him to the family. There was no wealth, title or a horse in sight. Princess Anne is totally non-judgmental but the fact that she, he had achieved, you know, World Cup winning fame, you know, in, in the rugby world, you know, he was right up there in, uh, in, her, in her way because the princess loves rugby. In contrast to Zara, her mother Anne found happiness in a much more traditional figure. Her husband, Timothy Lawrence, was a query to the Queen. But with Zara, her normal life had allowed her to look further afield, and Mike was a welcome breath of fresh air. If you think about the Queen and the sort of people that were at her table in 1952 when she first became queen. Well, now at Easter, um, she has people like Mike Tyndall at the table, who's a very different character from, let's say, the late Duke of Beaufort, master of the horse, a great keen huntsman at Badminton, etc. By introducing Mike Tyndall into the family, she is sort of showing how times change. Their relationship added a softer side into the somewhat stiff family dynamic. You can't ever imagine Anne hugging and kissing anybody. Zara, on the other hand, is very tactile. She does like to hug and kiss her friends. As a world-class athlete, Mike's work ethic was also just what Zara needed. The one thing that the family really loved was that he encouraged her to start taking her sporting talent seriously. Of course, he was a big rugby player at the time, captain of the England rugby team. And here he was saying to Zara, well, you know, you can go after this, you can do this. And, and that's exactly what she did. So I think the family will always be very grateful to Mike for encouraging her to pursue that ambition. I guess in a way, Mike Tyndall really tamed Zara's rebellious streak. For all of Mike's reputation for being, you know, hard living, hard playing, he, he actually was a pretty sobering influence on Zara. They moved in together and seven years passed without drama. And it was interesting, when Zara and Mike got together, they were in the tabloids, well, oh, hardly ever. In 2011, in a year of wedding fever, the Queen's eldest granddaughter married at Canongate Kirk in Edinburgh. And in spite of the high-profile guest list, it flew remarkably low under the radar. How did Zara, the former rebel royal, managed to avoid a media circus for her royal wedding. I think 2011 was particularly interesting in terms of comparing what it means to be in different positions within the royal family. On April 29th, we had that epic, full-scale royal wedding of, of William and Kate. 
Just a couple of months later, we get to July and there are Zara and Mike Tindall going through their nuptials in a much smaller, much lo more low-key fashion. The doors of the 17th century church were firmly closed to any cameras. It looked very relaxed. People remember they seen Mike Tindall chewing gum. He was criticised for chewing gum in public. Right? I mean, he was just getting rid of his own bridegroom nerves, I imagine. Of course, we had the, uh, the wedding of uh, William and Kate at the, at the same time, and all the focus was on them, as indeed it had to be. And Zara didn't mind that a bit. I think that was a sort of prime example of, of the freedom that comes with being a non-titled member of the royal family. They invited 400 wedding guests, modest compared to the party of Prince William, which numbered nearly 2,000. Zara's wedding would have been something that she herself, obviously with Mike Tyndall, they chose it and uh, didn't have to fit into any particular royal category, unlike Princess Anne, who obviously had one of the well, one of the really full royal weddings to Mark Phillips um, with carriage processions and Westminster Abbey and everything. She didn't need the guest list of state dignitaries and, and other members of other royal families. She was able to have her and Mike's friends. It felt very much like a family wedding, but one with plenty of nods to tradition. They were able to keep things really, really personal. But back in 1973, a 23-year-old Princess Anne was forced to have a very different big day. That was anything but personal. It was, of course, a state occasion, and uh, everyone, I mean, the whole world and his wife were watching, what, 500 million were watching on TV. As the only daughter of the Queen, and her first child to marry as a princess, Anne had no choice but to give the public what they wanted. I suspect that Princess Anne probably thought the whole um, wedding was, an, as it were, a necessary evil. Would she have preferred a much smaller wedding? Yes, I, I think so. It's quite something to have to share that with the rest of the world. So when Anne married for a second time to Timothy Lawrence in December 1992, it was attended by only 30 people. The wedding was held at Crathy Church, which is uh, near the Balmoral Estate. It's where the royal family chooses to worship when they're in residence at Balmoral. And, just like her daughter Zara's wedding, no cameras were allowed inside the church. It was very quiet, but it was very peaceful. But the locals in Ballata, the local village just outside Balmoral Castle, all know the royal family. And it was a very, very, very pleasant uh, wedding ceremony. Anne is not remotely interested in a fuss. I think Anne's second wedding was much more in keeping with her personality. Second time round, Anne got the wedding she wanted perhaps paving the way for Zara to have hers. Did Anne's decision for Zara early on allow her to be her true self, free from expectations and royal constraints? She was left on her own and to enjoy herself, but there were pictures of her out in nightclubs and bars in Sydney. And just how similar are they when it comes to rebellious fashion choices? She was the first member of the royal family to wear a miniskirt. Princess Anne was born into her royal role, but it was never something she wanted for her daughter. By handing Zara the freedom to be herself, she created a unique bond between mother and daughter, born out of trust and a determination not to be defined by title, even if that did raise some eyebrows. She did have a bit of a reputation of being a, a wild royal. Princess Anne's daughter, Zara, has joined Keith and the Prodigy and Spice Girl Mel B by getting her tongue pierced. It made front page in nearly every newspaper in Britain. Just behind the Queen Mother, Princess Anne's daughter, Zara, who's reported to have a stud in her tongue nowadays. And everyone's like, oh, a member of the royal family gets a tongue ring? Today, I mean, it wouldn't even... It wouldn't be a, a byline. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be a... a a forethought or anything like that, nothing whatsoever. It's extraordinary, really, but it was a very daring thing for her to do. She said to one of the newspapers, oh, my parents would have been far more upset if I'd got a tattoo. She made the decision to take a gap year. So she spent several months in New Zealand and Australia. Um, for the most part, she was left on her own and to enjoy herself. But there were pictures of her out in nightclubs and bars in Sydney. Apparently she was bungee jumping in New Zealand. So I think she was doing what most kids do when they leave school, going off and having a bit of a wild time. Anne too was considered rebellious in her younger days, but her actions now seem tame. 
In allowing Zara extra freedoms, was she giving her daughter a life she'd always wanted for herself? Anne was, was very much labelled a free spirit, a bit of a wayward royal, certainly by the press. People were stunned when footage emerged when Princess Anne was only 19 and uh, she was filmed driving a 52-ton chieftain tank across rugged terrain. With her recent visit to a North Sea gas rig, the first member of the fair sex ever to be allowed on board one, the princess must be getting used to setting precedents. She's obviously willing to try her hand at anything that comes her way. Now that didn't make her a royal rebel, but it certainly made her a woman who knew what she wanted to do in life. Zara Phillips has shown uh, the same level of determination in terms of she won't be told, no, I can't do something. Some of Anne's early antics may have been daring, but she paved the way for her daughter to blaze a far more daring trail, especially for a royal. Shortly after returning from her travels in 2000, she was reported to have hosted an Anne Summers party at Gatcombe Park. Perhaps not wanting to conform the way people might expect her to as a member of the royal family, but nonetheless having plenty of fun. She was pushing the boundaries for a, a young member of the royal family in those days. Not that Anne didn't push boundaries in some ways herself. Her dress sense as a younger woman was viewed as bold. She was the first member of the royal family to wear a miniskirt. Which was frowned on by a lot of other people outside the royal family, but not from anybody in, inside, of course. That was definite trend setting. And in 2003, 22-year-old Zara could be similarly daring on a visit to Royal Ascot, because unlike her mother, she wasn't a princess. So Zara was quite bold and brave in her fashion statements. She had an off-the-shoulder dress with a sort of, I think it was slightly off the shoulder, but the thing that caught the attention was there's a split right up to her thigh. In the late 90s or early noughties, um, the fashions could be quite naughty. She'll try stuff and like every woman, she gets it right and she gets it wrong and she should definitely be allowed that. Back in the early 70s, Zara's mother was similarly experimental. If you look at the sort of fashion she was popping out at the time, bright canary shift dresses, you know, um, bold prints um, in the 70s, you know, um, big colours, statement hats. But Anne's fashion sense has become more conservative with age, in part down to the requirements of her royal role, something Zara hasn't had to contend with. It is function over fashion. Anne is a princess royal doing a duty. I think the reason she's worn the same hairstyle for so many decades is to make sure that the focus is on the work, not on what she looks like. As a full-time athlete, her daughter has a similar approach. Zara's role, Zara's job, is as a hard-working, top-of-her-game equestrian. That's her duty, that's her priority. And then there's the casual Zara. If she had a choice of what to wear, I think she'd grab her jeans and be very, very happy. I think Zara has a, a style, and I think it's definitely more um, a modern woman than it is princess. Despite Anne's fashion choices being somewhat dictated by her position, they have made her something of an icon. Anne is called thrifty in her fashion sense because Anne is a practical woman and sees no sense in buying something and wearing it just once. I think they call it in the royal family uh, good old Hanoverian housekeeping. Uh, one thing she once said to me was, a good suit can go on forever. Anne famously mocked her own thrifty nature when asked about it by Michael Parkinson. The press picked up on the fact that uh, you arrived wearing the same suit they claimed as you were wearing in 1978. It's older than that. It's older. <laughs> She's got items in her wardrobe that are likely older than her children. The fact she can still fit into them is remarkable. If only I could get into things that I, that I bought 30 years ago, and the fact that she still looks good in them, I think sends a really great, great message. She's a great champion for sustainable fashion. With more than 500 royal engagements a year in her diary, Anne's fashion choices have become her uniform for carrying out a role she was born to do. Her vocation, her calling, her duty, was always to be the Princess Royal. It is a life of service. It's something which she has always accepted. Princess Anne has inherited from her parents this profound sense of duty, absolute sense of duty, and indeed her dedication to public life 
overrides everything. Zara equally, as with, in, in a much quieter way, if you like, in a much less public way, she is just as devoted to the Queen. While Anne liberated her from a life of full-time royal duty, there are still some occasions when Zara will put in an appearance. Who exactly is a member of the royal family? And there are two ways of looking at that. There is a very uh, clear-cut list of who the members of the royal family are, and those are the ones that appear in the court circular. Well, Zara is obviously uh, a granddaughter of the Queen and very close to her and a very close member of the family and will appear at a great number of family occasions. She is not really technically a, a member of the royal family as such. The appearance is uh, you know, on the balcony uh, drooping the colour. Of course, there's the Christmas Day walk to church, there's the Easter walk to church. You will occasionally see Zara doing the odd duty, like perhaps handing out a cup at Cheltenham. She may not be an official royal, but Zara is clearly at the very heart of the younger Windsor family. William and Harry, uh, the closest cousins that Zara has got in, within the royal family, uh, lost their mother at that comparatively early age, uh, back in 1997. Um, Zara seemed to grow even closer to them. Uh, not long after Diana died, they, uh, the Prince of Wales decided they should all go on a skiing holiday. In January 1998, the world's press descended on Kloster's Germany for a photo call. Zara was sort of would try to chip them both up and she'd throw snowballs and they'd, they'd have a wrestle in the, in, in the snow. She was there to take the focus off them, take the pressure off. They used to hate those photo calls, but with Zara, everything is more fun because she's so gregarious. She's great to have around because of her positive energy and her zest for life. She was a huge help enormous help to those two and William in particular I think um, has always had a huge huge affection for Zara. William is, is quite serious by nature he's actually quite shy Zara is sort of the the comedy cousin that you can turn to where she takes the pressure off of everything and so that friendship is so authentic there are dozens of photos of William and Zara together over the years uh, laughing joking uh, there are time there's one time where prince william was holding an umbrella over zara he was protecting her from the rain i think he feels very protective towards her and she feels equally protective of him and zara has continued to support the family especially william from the sidelines for William in particular, trust is everything. So when you've got a cousin who understands what it is to be a member of the royal family, but they don't have the same pressures associated to it, they can be a tower of strength and support. In October 2013, William made Zara godparent to George, his first son and future king. It's Zara's total loyalty and dedication to her family that has made her such an asset to the cousins that have had to endure the negative side of royal life. She may not have a title because of her mother's early decision, but Zara has an integral role with those closest to the future of the crown. But what about her own children? Has Zara's freedom from royal expectations allowed her to discuss things that others might not? The loss of, of their baby um, was certainly one of the most personal things that Zara has ever spoken about. It's unusual for a royal to open up the way that she did. Even as a new mother, Anne was required to travel the world as a princess and leave Zara and her brother behind with a nanny. Zara's comparatively normal life means her own children do not have to compete with royal duties. I suppose Mia and Lena Tyndall have really got that full-time hands-on parental experience that Zara and Peter weren't able to have and Princess Anne certainly didn't have. Um, again, expectations change, generations change, but this is another one of the major pluses that comes with the freedom of being a non-titled member of the royal family. I think she's been very modern in, in her approach to parenting. Zara was encouraged and supported by a progressive mother but she's chosen to take it one step further, opening up about her personal struggles with motherhood. She shared the news of her miscarriage, which will have been devastating. Charities have welcomed the Queen's granddaughter, Zara Tyndall, which revealed she had a second miscarriage before having her second daughter last month. 
She previously had a miscarriage in 2016. And in an interview with the Sunday Times, she said, you need to go through a period where you don't talk about it because it's too raw. Speaking of the first miscarriage, she added, for me, the worst bit was that we had to tell everyone everyone knew. Her honesty on an emotive subject like miscarriage showed a personal approach from the famously stoic family. It's unusual for a royal to open up the way that she did. Um, she did it because she felt that it, it was important. Um, she, she wanted to talk about miscarriage and I suppose in doing so, try and break down some of the, the stigma around the subject. She was able to really speak to a broad cross-section of society and I think people really admired her bravery in that moment. She will open up. Um, she, you know, she's opened up about quite personal and private matters in a way that you know, Anne would never do. There were different expectations for Anne when she was both a mother and a representative of monarchy. But she still had a strong influence on Zara's parenting today. Actually, you know, she, she's probably looked not too far from how she was raised in terms of using that as a template. Zara returned to the Gatcombe estate in Gloucestershire to bring up her children, where she grew up out of the spotlight. But it also brought her nearer to her mother and is a sign of the closeness of their relationship. I think what's really lovely is that both Zara and Peter have stayed very close to home. They, they both live on the estate with their mother um, and Princess Anne spends a lot of time with them. Weekends are spent taking the children for pony rides and long walks around. Gatcom actually has a, a running farm on it as well. She's a good mother and she's actually uh, a very affectionate grandmother, which I think surprises quite a number of people. Anne's affection for Zara and now Zara's children has always defined their relationship. It's a unique mother and daughter bond that has existed since she was born. When Zara was born, I could see that Princess Anne was absolutely besotted. And I was surprised. And she really was besotted with this dear little baby girl in this way. And I've always felt that she was so affectionate towards Zara. And the way they seem to react with each other, certainly in public, is not a mummy and daddy, uh, mummy and child sort of thing. It really is more like, like sisters in that way. So it is a unique and very close and, and very strong relationship. I've never heard that Princess Anne and Zara didn't get on well together. I think they've always um, had lots of mutual interest and great, um, and great respect for each other. Anne has always shared a uniquely close relationship with her mother too. I think the Queen views Anne as someone she can totally depend on. There is so much trust and loyalty that exists between them. In 1982, after Michael Fagan broke into her bedroom in Buckingham Palace, it was Anne that the Queen looked to for comfort. To find this man sitting bleeding from his cut thumb on her bed, she must have been distressed. When it was all over, the first person she spoke to was Princess Anne. It was mother to daughter, woman to woman. The Queen, Anne, and now Zara are part of a line of strong royal women. Mothers and daughters bound not only by duty, but by love. These Windsor women are very, very close. It's a very, very powerful matriarchy. The women have been the key to the success of the institution, the key to the way that it reinvents itself. Together, the combination of Anne and Zara has become a force to be reckoned with, breathing life into the firm for the years ahead. They are both very determined, very ambitious women. They both cut their own path in life. Princess Anne was very much a trailblazer in many, many ways. She has a lot of firsts to her name. And although Anne turned 70 last year, she continues to build on what she's achieved for her family. We know that there's longevity in the royal family and Anne shows no sign of slowing down. She's still, still um, in lockdown year, she slowed down a bit, but, but until then, still four to 500 engagements a year. Everybody who, who, who gets her are absolutely thrilled to have her because she's uh, hugely supportive. Zara has shown us how the royals have evolved and how being liberated from any official role can lead to the model modern royal. I think it's probably inevitable that in years to come, we are not going to see a royal family as we have today. So I think it's important in the royal family, whether you have a title or not, that, that, that you have a constructive role. Princess Anne and her influence led Zara to live a much freer life, and perhaps a life that Anne would have preferred for herself.
Zara is an absolutely perfect example of a non-working member of the royal family who gives back to the community, who is present for her family, and yet she's also proven herself uh, on her own merits. She's worked really hard. She hasn't expected any kind of handouts. She's added a certain amount of celebrity, of course, and a great deal of glamour. But having lived a life without a title, she's also struck a balance between relatability and royalty. Being a member of the royal family, having a private life, but also using her position for good. And it's not easy to achieve. Anne broke the mold to give her daughter freedom to push the boundaries in every aspect of her life. One thing has always struck me about the similarity between uh, mother and daughter, Anne and Zara, is their independence of spirit. And together, mother and daughter have shown you can merge duty, lineage and ambition to do what you want. I only wish if there could be a blueprint for future generations on how to find that balance and how to live a non-royal life in a royal world, Zara Tyndall's it. We should expect to see more royals like Zara in years to come. give you lots of advice. Yeah, and uh, criticism. <laughs> it is a unique and very close and, and very strong relationship. From sporting achievements. Anne was the very first member of the royal family to compete in the Olympics. Zara was the very first member of the royal family to get a medal in the Olympics. To their modern day love lives. I think Zara is, is very much like her mother in that she is a free spirit. She's had some quite colourful boyfriends in the past. The Princess Royal and her commoner daughter have far more in common than on first glance. This is the story of how these two women have defied and defined our royal family. The 15th of May, 1981. Princess Anne has a baby girl, both are well. Zara's delivery was, was positive and quite urgent. I think she went into labour quite quickly with Zara. Good evening. Princess Anne tonight gave birth to a baby girl, a sister for Peter, who's now three, and she's the Queen's first granddaughter. It's not yet known what the new baby will be called, but whatever her name, she'll be sixth in line to the throne. From the very outset, the Queen's first granddaughter was marked out for an untraditional royal life, firstly in her name. Zara is quite untraditional, it's an unusual choice um, for a royal name. Zara lives up to her name, which means bright as the dawn, and I think it was a very imaginative suggestion that came from Anne's favourite brother, Prince Charles. I suppose the very naming of Zara with such an unusual and in many ways unroyal name perhaps set the precedence for a remarkably unroyal life, which is what Zara's enjoyed when you look at it. Anne decided very early on um, that, that her children would not be public figures in the way that she was. The key to understanding everything